Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. Today we're going to have an intriguing conversation as we welcome back our good friend Shauna Rodenbach to the show. Today's topic is the problems that we face with embalming. Shauna, why don't you get us started? What are we doing wrong? Well, a number of things. <laughs> so, with a lot of embalmers, um, one of the famous lines that embalmers hear right when they start their apprenticeship is, forget what you learned in school, you won't use any of it, do it our way. But the biggest issue with that is depending on what funeral facility you're at, you could have a hundred different ways and maybe some of them are good, maybe some of them aren't, but we end up with what we refer to in the industry as fluid pushers. And Dan, I'm sure you're well aware of what I mean when I say fluid pushers. <laughs> yes, I think I've heard, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that and I've heard your first uh, uh, sentiments as well about, uh, <laughs> about forget it all, forget it all. <laughs> yeah, right, we've right. all heard it. Yeah. But one of the things that we have to remember is that when we're teaching you something in, in school, we're doing it for a reason. Granted, there are some of us that like to just stand up there and pontificate, <laughs> but there, there is a deeper reason that we're going through a lot of these concepts. And it's in order to make sure that a new embalmer not only understands how to find an artery and put a cannula in it and start injecting, but really understands what the chemicals that they're using are doing how to adjust the pressure and rate of flow depending on the reaction that the body is giving you and depending on individual pathologies and really how to make sure that that body is as preserved as it can possibly be while preserving the aesthetic to make sure that that individual looks like they're supposed to look. So I'll give you an example. I have heard from numerous different embalmers that with cases of extreme edema, for example, they will embalm normally. And when that body starts to decompose prior to the funeral, well, there's nothing we could do. That's just how these cases go. And I contend that there absolutely is a lot that you can do. And that is not just how those cases go. So there is a dreaded calculation that we are supposed to do for every case when we're trying to determine what percentage of chemical we're putting into the body. And that is C1 times B1 equals C2 times B2. To make it more accessible, it is index times the ounces of arterial fluid equals percentage times total volume in ounces. So for someone that is just starting to learn, that may not mean a whole lot. Index is the number that you see on the bottle that tells you the concentration of formaldehyde inside the bottle. That is the grams of formaldehyde per 100 milliliters of total solution. So if I have a 30 index fluid, I know that there are 30 grams of formaldehyde in every 100 milliliters of solution contained in that bottle. The ounces of arterial fluid is how many ounces coming out of the bottle we're going to put into, into the tank. On the other side of the equation, when we're looking at percentage, that percentage is once we mix the solution with water, what percentage of formaldehyde are we actually putting into the body? 
that's diluted and in between and then multiplied by the total volume, which is going to be how much total volume is inside the tank, and that's water and um, arterial solution. That formulation works great in order to make sure that you're using enough fluid to get that percentage that you want. And that percentage is going to be based on case analysis. So if you have a, a really good case, that tiny little pink old lady that is still warm, rigor mortis hasn't set in yet, you've got bulging vessels, so you know you're going to have good distribution and diffusion. Very easy case. You could probably go with a 2% solution. However, if you have a more complicated case, you can go up to a 5% solution, which uh, I, I refer to as the oh crud percentage. <laughs> um, that is where you're not entirely sure that individual has a circulatory system left, but you're going to go ahead and give it the old college try. So you, you've got a lot of case analysis in between there to determine what percentage is appropriate for the body that you're working on. Now, when you're looking at a case with edema, we have something called secondary dilution. Secondary dilution means that you've diluted the, the chemical once when you put it into the tank and you've added water because water is a vehicle that allows the formaldehyde to be distributed through the system without automatically adhering to the circulatory system and closing off those, those capillaries, which is going to prevent diffusion. Secondary dilution is what happens once the chemical enters the body and then becomes diluted by the amount of edema that is inside the body. So I could have a 3% solution in my tank, but depending on how much water is in the body itself, once I introduce that amount of solution into the body, I could be diluting it down to less than 1%, which means that according to my calculations, I should be okay. But in reality, I'm not actually really preserving that body at all. So we do a calculation for secondary dilution. A gallon of water is going to weigh approximately eight pounds. So if I know approximately how much weight the individual has gained in edema, I can calculate with pretty good accuracy how much water is in the system. Let's say the individual has 80 pounds of edema. Well, I know that they have an additional 10 gallons of water in the system. So when I'm doing my initial calculation, my total volume is going to have 10 extra gallons of water. And when I calculate that out, I might end up using 10 to 12 bottles of arterial fluid in my injection. Now, a lot of old school embalmers, funeral home owners may hear that and go, oh, 12 bottles of arterial fluid in one body? Oh, no, 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 no. That's too expensive. You're wasting arterial fluid. But to that, I would say, what's more expensive? Adding extra arterial fluid or the court case that's going to result from presenting a body that is decomposing in front of a family. So we need to make sure that we have thorough preservation. There are also lots of other things that we can do to reduce the amount of water in the system to begin with. 
So we can use Epsom salts, which takes the, the use of osmosis to pull the moisture out of the system and send it out of the body um, in the venous drainage that we're taking. Um, a and there are also a lot of edema products that will do a lot of the same thing. Some of the problems that come with edema products is that it takes it a while to pull the moisture out of the system. And we get something that I refer to as the deflated balloon effect. So the body is embalmed while it's larger, while it's full of fluid. And the, once it's allowed to sit for a while, the swelling goes down overnight, but the, the superficial tissues such as the skin have been embalmed at a larger size. So once they start to reduce, you get a lot of wrinkling. And Dan, I'm sure that you've seen this in, in your practice as well. You have to do a little bit of fixing to, to make sure that those wrinkles aren't as evident when you present the body. When you do a secondary dilution calculation and use the, the proper amount of formaldehyde to begin with, that water starts to come out immediately. The body starts to reduce immediately. So rather than preserving the body in a larger state, that body is already reducing during the embalming process and you're preserving the body in a smaller state and you don't get that deflated balloon effect. Sorry, that was a really long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a very great answer. <laughs> So is there anything that we could do to improve? And I know that's a loaded question. It, it really is. But one of the things that we absolutely need to do in order to improve is to ensure that we have a standard for what we are teaching new embalmers. Two bottles of Care 25 in three gallons of, of total fluid is not the solution for every single case. And that's something that we need to just really bore into the heads of, of not only new embalmers, but seasoned, experienced embalmers as well. The family mix that you've used on every single body for the last 20 years is not necessarily appropriate for every single body. You need to make sure that you are utilizing case analysis so that you are using the chemicals in the most effective way possible. Now, your two bottles of Care 25 and three gallons of water might work for most cases, but when you get to cases, you know, going back to the edema example, when you get to cases like that, um, Care 25 is probably going to be one of the worst solutions you could use. You don't ever want to put a humectant into a body that already has too much moisture because the, the goal of a humectant is to retain moisture. So we don't want to do that in a case where we've got too much of it. So really driving home the concept of thorough case analysis and amping up a student's understanding of the chemicals that they're using, the chemistry behind it, the processes that are, undergo that are undergoing in the body, such as, you know, the principles of osmosis or how a, a protein is preserved because Protein is really the only thing that formaldehyde is attaching to. It's not attaching to adipose. It's not doing anything else. Um, so understanding the protein content of a certain body versus the lipid content of a certain body is really going to improve the skill of the embalmer and get us to a point where embalming is once again both an art and the science. And that deeper understanding is what we really need. 
Great. Now, I know I hear day in and day out, I, you know, I hear it from a lot of the funeral directors, uh, at least maybe in my area, where they say, you know, oh, I got this trade embalmer, I don't like their work, I don't like what they're doing, they got razor burn, they got this, the bodies are decomposing, the, you know, they just don't look presentable to the family, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to embalm, you know, that's not been my skill set, I like working with family, so I hire this guy to do it. Um, what words of advice do you have? We have a lot of students, obviously, they're coming out of school, they're getting the, you know, maybe the theory, they're getting, you know, the hands-on experience that the mm -hmm. mortuary science programs can provide, uh, and then they're out at these funeral homes, and then they say, you know, I really like embalming, I want to be a trade embalmer, uh, or just embalm for maybe their own location. Any advice that you could provide uh, to both sides, the funeral homes, as well as those that seek to be trade embalmers, but... Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I spent a good portion of my career doing trade work and still do it occasionally. Not as much as I used to, but I still do it occasionally. Um, first and foremost, for the owner, fire that trade embalmer. Do not continue to give them business if they are not giving you quality embalming. Now, it is true that unless you know everything that happened during the embalming process, you don't necessarily know what that embalmer had to work with. However, that is the point of the case report. Start looking at those case reports. Have it filled out for every single person that goes through that preparation room. If they are pencil whipping the case reports and there's not a lot of information on it, that's a red flag. Get rid of them. You want detailed information on exactly what happened during the embalming process, not only so that you understand the condition that the body is in, but if, heaven forbid, at some point a family decides to seek legal action against you, you need as much information as humanly possible to back yourself up. And you also need to be able to show on those case reports that you have done everything within your professional skill set that is possible to make sure that that particular body was presentable. Um, there are all these circumstances where that's not possible. Advanced decomposition, um, someone who has had enough trauma that reconstruction is not possible. But in most cases, with a deeper understanding of a lot of the concepts that we teach in school, there are a lot of things that can be done. And you don't want someone that's going to cut corners and give you a bad product. With that said, funeral home owners need to be willing to give some of the new guys a chance. A lot of these individuals have really good base knowledge. They just need to develop their skill set through practice. And that's what a lot of people in our industry tend to forget. That's what the apprenticeship is for. Nobody is going to walk into their apprenticeship knowing everything. Some people will think they will, but nobody is actually going to walk in knowing everything. They need that experience to be able to develop their skills. And if you take someone with a strong base knowledge, allow them to develop their skills in the preparation room, you are going to have an absolutely fantastic embalmer at the end of their apprenticeship. Someone who is skilled, knowledgeable, and can troubleshoot a lot of issues. On the flip side of that, as experienced embalmers, we need to be accessible to new embalmers to allow them to get knowledge from us. Things that over the years we figured out absolutely work, things over the years that we figured out absolutely do not work, and get some of our experience given to these new embalmers so that they can develop and hopefully surpass us, be better than us. Um, if that's the ultimate goal, I can't tell you how happy I am 
when a new embalmer teaches me something I didn't know. And it happens all the time. I've been doing this for 20 years and by no means am I an expert in everything. I'm still learning things all the time. Um, and that's kind of one of the great things about what, we're, what we do for a living um, is, is every case is different. Every case is going to give you individual challenges. So my experience may not be the same as someone else's and someone else may have figured out something that I've been overlooking for 20 years. It's possible and it happens all the time. So for the student that wants to be the trade embalmer, find somewhere where they are open to teaching, open to allow you to use the knowledge that you have, and also really get out there and network. One of the biggest things about funeral service is it is a lot about who you know. And the more you network, the more you become known, the more likely it is that people are going to utilize your services. And if you are known as an excellent embalmer, people will start using you on a regular basis. Great. Yeah, I always remind my students, uh, you know, class, and I say, tell them, remind them at graduation that they are colleagues, not competitors, and that Absolutely. the funeral home down the street does a horrible job with their embalming or services. It reflects you too as a profession. So we always have to grow yes. together, and that we absolutely, you know, absolutely, and that is a big issue in our industry. Um, you know, with with small business. Everyone struggles to keep their head above water. And I understand that. I get that. It is not easy for a small business owner, especially when you have a lot of corporate funeral homes and things of the sort to compete with. But one of the most important things that we need to remember is that we are all colleagues. And I don't care who is down the road from me. There's something I can learn from them. And likely there is something they can learn from me as well. We are all colleagues. We are all representatives of this profession. And it is our job to put our best foot forward regardless of how that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, with an embalming, is there a point you're meeting with a family? And I know there's, you know, oftentimes we see a disconnect between the body hasn't you know, the removal hasn't taken place, the body hasn't made it to the funeral home, and yet we're mm -hmm. already meeting uh, with the family and, you know, expectations uh, may be misrepresented. Um, is there a line? I know, and that's a very gray line, uh, understand this, but is there a line where we determine that this is a closed casket or um, where we say, I can do that, I can make that work, and I can make your loved one viewable? Well, first and foremost, it is always essential, regardless of your initial impression of the remains, to never promise anything. Always let the family know that you will do everything that you can, but never ever promise anything. Because you don't know what's going to go wrong. Um, there have been cases throughout my career where I looked at them and I, I was like, ah, oh, this will be easy. And then I start embalming and it is the worst fiasco I have ever experienced in my life. And I, I'm sure that you've, you've experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, you know, looks can be very deceiving. I've also had cases where I look at it and I'm like, eh, I'm not sure about this. And it ends up actually being a fairly easy embalming and I'm able to clear discoloration and, and get a very good result. So you, you never really know when you first start out. My, my thought on that is that you never know where the line is until you try. Never promise a family that you're going to be able to deliver an open casket, especially in cases of severe trauma, decomposition, things of the sort. However, always try. 
And even if the family is like, well, I think we'll probably have a closed casket, I will usually look at them and say, let me see what I can do. I'm not going to promise anything, but let me see what I can accomplish. And if I think that, you know, when I'm done, the result is favorable, I'll have you come in and take a look and see if maybe you can reconsider. Some families will say, no, we just want to close casket. We respect that. Other families will agree and say, okay, you know, see what you can do. I have had circumstances where I've had uh, trauma for restorations, for example, where, you know, according to the textbook, if there's X amount, uh, X percentage of, you know, actual structure left, you should be able to do a restoration. If there isn't, restoration is not possible. That's not always the case. There are times where, okay, you may not have X amount of structure, but you try it anyway, see what you come up with. If the family is pleased with it, you have an open casket. Um, if the family doesn't think that individual looks correct, you might have done an excellent job, but if the family doesn't think that individual looks correct, then the, the casket may close. Um, but it's important to let the family decide once embalming has taken place. Now, cases like extreme decomposition where there's not a lot of soft tissue left, there's only bone structure, that is a safe case to be able to say to the family an open casket would not be possible. But if there's a circulatory system left, give it a try. Absolutely. You know, and I, I'm thinking back to my uh, my apprenticeship where I preserved a body. Um, honestly, I was not impressed. I, I was scared. I'm sitting there sweating, absolutely sweating when the family came in to look at their loved one next to the casket, you know, obviously being an apprentice, I was new to this, and um, to me, it was horrible work, or at least mm -hmm. I thought, and then the family came in and went, wow, that's the best he's ever looked, he's never looked so good in his life, <laughs> and I looked and went, oh, wow, <laughs> so I didn't realize, <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that, uh, that what I had done, actually, that, you know, improved his appearance apparently <laughs> and i didn't i didn't uh, yeah, i didn't give myself yeah. enough credit so i always laugh about laugh about that and what we do is incredibly subjective you know you might think that you have done the best job ever and the family might come in and go no um you might think you've done the worst job ever and the family might come in and go oh my goodness that's my dad um and it's, it's so important to really listen to what the family is saying, to really take into account all of the factors that go into making that individual's appearance what they remember. And you know, there, there are circumstances such as protruding teeth, for example. There are individuals who throughout their lives have never really closed their mouths. Um, you can see their teeth all the time. Every picture, when they're sleeping, those teeth are always protruding. And as, as embalmers were taught, those lips have to be closed. They have to be closed. Figure out a way to do it. And my contention is, well, if you've seen those teeth, in every circumstance throughout life, why would I cover them up when they're dead? There are ways to close the mouth that the needle injector barbs or the ligature is not showing in the front of the mouth. And you can tastefully make sure that the, the jaw is closed, the mouth is closed but those teeth are still showing like they were in life. And I have had families absolutely elated to see someone look like they did in life 
instead of looking like they're pursing their lips because we were trying so hard to close their mouth because that's what we're taught to do. It is so, so important to listen to the family and everything that they're telling you because ultimately that family is who you're serving. You are not presenting that body to, you are not, you know, you are serving that family. No, oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, um, I remember back to many occasions, you know, where exactly that happened, where I remember sitting across from the family and having a, uh, you know, having that serious conversation, having the uh, paperwork on the desk to do something, change, change something, you know, I need that restorative mm -hmm. paperwork, uh, or signed, you know, to make a change, and the family is mad at me, telling me that I did it, you know, that I may, you know, I'm the one that changed the appearance, even though I'm mm -hmm. now asking for permission that before I do it, because they could, you know, showing them their loved one in the parlor first before I did it, and they're mad, and they're mad, and I remember back to one situation where, uh, you know, I needed to, you know, fix the eyes, and they were mad, and I, they thought I changed. I said I didn't do that. I didn't do that, but I can do it. And we were on the we were on two different pages. I remember that day we were on two different pages. They were mad because her hair color was different. They thought that we changed their hair, her hair color. Oh goodness! Yeah, <laughs> and you know, and uh, little did they know that the day that the morning that she died, she had had her hair dyed, and <laughs> and right, but you know, so sometimes that communication. I remember being, you know, uh, sitting across from this family, and they're yelling at me, and I don't know why they're yelling at me, because I'm trying to explain that, you know, we didn't do it, uh, but um, we finally came to the conclusion that they said, oh, you think we're referring to, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, oh, no, that's how she looked in life. I said, <laughs> oh, okay, then we leave it that way, because that's how she looked in life, right. that's how it's, she's going to look in death, and, you know, that was appropriate, but I do remember that, you know, <laughs> being yelled at for changing her hair color, uh, so I thought that was funny. Well, even, even something as simple as, um, you know, there are individuals that have distinguishing marks on their face that people have become accustomed to, and sometimes those distinguishing marks might be um, like a pore of liner that has been there for an extended period of time. Um, removing that might change the entire appearance of that individual. I had a family that came in one time and I had removed all of the blackhead that the deceased had had because, you know, thinking sanitation it's it's bacterial contamination and have to remove it um and there were some very large ones that i know had been there for a very long time the family came in and they're like well he looks great but he just doesn't look right and they it came down to they were used to seeing those he had those for the past 15 20 years and, you know, it's so it's it's so important to listen to them. Absolutely. And it definitely emphasizes the value in families bringing in pictures ahead of time as well. You know, not. Oh, absolutely. You know, and not one from World War Two that, you know, when they were in their <laughs> 20s. Um, but, you know, how and I know I tell my students all the time, I said, you know, you know, ask the family, say, hey, can you get a obituary, you know, photo for the obituary? And, you know, while, you know, I said, when I send my apprentice out, you know, and I encourage them all to do the same, I said, you know, you're in the house and go, wow, that's a really nice photo of your dad on the mantle. Do you mind if I take a picture of that? Because I want to make sure that I comb his hair in the right direction. I said, they don't need to know it's yeah. for something like you're saying with the blackheads or for the, you know, <laughs> fact that I'm going to make sure I don't make his round head you know, oval by accident, you know, with my chemicals by, you know, dehydrating or, you know, Absolutely. adding extra fluid. They don't need to know that. But Absolutely. so I hit his hair in the right direction, I said, because it's going to be, <laughs> that's going to help you so much in your embalmer, you know. Yeah. Right, right. And yeah. especially cases like with extreme emaciation, maybe the individual has been sick for a long period of time. There are lots of ways that we can build up weight or the appearance of weight 
through the embalming process. But before you do that, you need plenty of pictures of what that individual looked like when they were healthy. Because the last thing you want to do is add too much weight and have mom looking a whole lot plumper than she ever really did in life. And alternately, you don't want to not add enough and still have her look sick. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Any words of wisdom uh, that you could impart upon our uh, listeners, whether they be seasoned embalmers or students, apprentices, or someone looking to uh, join our profession uh, so that they don't fall victim to the existing problems and they can ensure that they're providing the best care that they can? Sure, sure. One of the things that I, I tell new embalmers and seasoned embalmers alike is never get comfortable. Do not rest on your laurels. Continue to learn. Continue to explore. Continue to improve. Years of experience mean nothing if you've been doing it wrong for an extended period of time. And the lack of experience doesn't always necessarily mean that you don't know what you're doing. The, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. The result is what we're looking for. So if someone who's been embalming for two years is doing a better job than someone who's been embalming for 30, well, utilize that person that's been embalming for two years because they're obviously doing something right. Um, but don't discount, uh, you know, at the same time, don't discount experience. There's a lot to be said for it. Um, but it's not always everything. So don't rest on your laws. Continue to grow. Continue to improve. Well, thank you so much. Now, you also have a embalming workbook out right now, right? I do. It, it is a laboratory manual that has uh, 16 sessions. It's through Kendo Hunt Publishing, and it is just called Embalming. All right. And I've, and I've of course, reviewed this book, and it's a phenomenal uh, piece of work uh, that you've oh, worked you. on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do have a link on our Mortuary Mayhem website to make that easy for our listeners to find. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today. And Absolutely. yeah, and we're going to have you back in a future month to discuss advanced embalming. Great. Well, thank you so much. Check out the mortuarymayhem.com website. We have a lot of great, exciting things coming up in the next couple months. In March, we have the Certified Funeral Celebrant Training coming to Massachusetts. And in June, we will be traveling to Peru. Visit the mortuarymayhem.com website, scroll down till you see the llama, and enroll to join us in Peru. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime.